Shalom, welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabados of Dummer, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of jbiztechphilly.com and statewide news. And as you can see as I hold it up, the columnist for the Jewish press. And I'm very proud to uh, write, to have the opportunity to write a column called the Albany Beat. And I talk about how government relates to the Jewish community, or doesn't, as the case may be. But today we're taking a little break from All government. Right. We're going to talk about the arts. We love talking about the arts on the, uh, the Jewish view. A lot of uh, the of audience uh, supports uh, Park Playhouse and also the Palace Theater. So we brought the guy who is in charge of both, Owen Smith. So welcome to the Jewish view. Owen, very good. Thank you. Thank you to you well, both. The Jewish people are always, I think, very highly representative in supporting the arts. I've yes. certainly seen that throughout my whole career. By all means, when it comes to audience participation, to donors, the community is certainly very, very active. Yeah. And the, uh, the per woman who founded Park Playhouse, Mimi Scott. Yeah, yeah, who, who still comes every year, is every she year. Up from Florida? She does, She well, and, and she maintains a residence in New York City still yeah. to this day. Uh, and, you know, Mimi's continued to write and in her later years has actually found uh, a, a lot of joy in being a visual artist too. Mm -hmm. She's been working not only in oil, but also in, in some stained glass. Uh, so, oh, no. uh, <laughs> but she, you know, Park Playhouse, which she founded with her late husband Barry, was just yeah. such a passion to her. Uh, and when I came on board as the producing artistic director back in 2010, I heard from her almost immediately. Uh, and she was there that summer. She liked what she saw. She was glad that we were sort of maintaining the tradition. Keeping it free was the most important thing to her, providing access to people in the community, you know. Uh, and she's been there every year since. Well, and once, I, you know, well once you talk about free, so who is funding? I well, mean, nothing's ever free, no, free, no, I mean, that, that's, our, that's our saying, right? I mean, free theater isn't free, unfortunately. There's a heavy price tag with that. But, you know, our funding is essentially a, a mixture of corporate foundation and individual giving. Uh, there, uh, there at a, for a, a long time, there had been a, a fairly substantial municipal contribution to Park Playhouse's operations. That how much? Uh, uh, well, when things first started, it was about $75,000. Okay. Uh, at the time that I came on board, it was about $55,000. Uh, some of the in-kind support the city had provided in terms of sound and lights had, had changed over the years. But uh, unfortunately, uh, no. during the economic downturn, the, the city arts grant program went away. Luckily, Mayor Sheehan has put a new program in place, uh, the Mayor's Fund for the Capital City, uh, that is a competitive grant cycle through the Community Foundation. But that's a new program. Oh, We've, so there is the Mayor's Fund here? There is, a, it's a, but it's a, a sort of a... Because in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg started that in New yes. York City. And that's for people who feel they're not paying enough in taxes here, that they want to give even more so that they could give to uh, yeah. funding what the city yeah, really I, can. This is uh, <laughs> like that. This is not compulsory. It is certainly a volunteer. How I'm much money comes in? Uh, you know, that's a new fund, so I'm not sure. Really? The, the, it's only their first year really? of operation. But, yeah. I, but I have to say that it, you, you're glad to see that. Yes. You know, you're glad to see a mayor putting focus on uh, on the arts and, and the fact that they're an economic driver and, and really just a cultural necessity in a community. So I've been happy to see that, that, that that's come about. That's not something that we've yet been a beneficiary of, but certainly something we look forward to. You know, I always say that because the society obviously needs laws of policemen, firemen, all the basic structure, but society always needs the arts. And I think that's very important for, I mean, we talk about with a lot of times with children and you know, getting to know about theater and music, and they, that's the first thing they cut out. Mm, it's and, unfortunate. you know, and it just appears, well, you need math. Well, I agree, you need the math and science, of course. Sure. But, you know, it's just something people, a lot of people have the attitude it's periphery and it's not needed. Yeah. And I just think it, it is an essential part of it. I think it is, Rabbi. And I think that, you know, what people, the mistake that people make is that they, they think that arts are all about culture, and they are to a certain extent, but they're also about communication, and a big part of what we do is arts education through Park Playhouse, and we've been lucky enough through our relationship with the Palace Theater to now have some spaces to work in, some studio spaces to host classes all year round, and we're hosting classes for kids that have uh, all sorts of experience in the arts, but also kids who have never had a performing arts experience in their life, and to watch these kids walk in the door, not want to look anyone in the eye, be afraid to communicate with their peers, let alone those that are older than them, 
and leave the class after a 10-week session with just that little bit of confidence that allows them to connect outside themselves, to connect with people, that's what the arts are all about. And that's why it's not, it shouldn't be on the periphery. But you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, on a, on a scholastic level, these are often the first things to get cut. Talk about education. Is Shirley Ahrensberg still the director of education? She is, and she has been since I, when well, I she's was. She's a member of the Jewish community. She is, okay. yeah. Shirley attends Congregation Beth Emmeth. Uh, yeah. Shirley has been the director of education for over 20 years. When I was a young man, I was a student in Park Playhouse to the youth for the teen so you're youth from program. Albany? I am, you're yeah, Delmar. yeah, yeah. Delmar. I grew up in Delmar. Uh, Good but city. I, that's that's right. Delmar. That's right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and where I continue to reside with my wife Julie, uh, who also was a student in the Park Playhouse Two program when we were kids. Uh, so I've known Shirley for uh, the better part of uh, to almost 25 years now. Uh, and she still is very active in our programming. Which absolutely. is the better part of your life. That's right. That's right. Yes, yeah. Because you're not much yeah. older than 25. Maybe not quite 25, but close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, she's very active. And, you know, Shirley uh, actually just finished. Uh, she hasn't slowed down at all. You know, we just finished a, a school tour. One of the things that we do now that's, that's new to Park Playhouse is we take shows out into schools in the capital area. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just did a production of A Year with Frog and Toad, which is based on the, the sort of classic stories that were created by Arnold Lobel. Uh, about a frog and a toad who are friends and learn all sorts of lessons and spending their seasons together. And uh, it was a lovely show that we took out into the schools that surely addressed the children before every performance. That's wonderful. So what is, uh, so what's your budget now? What do you need in terms of an annual budget to continue on that you, What's your goal, fundraising goal? Well, for Park yeah, Playhouse, aside from as much as possible. Sure, I mean Park Playhouse, our overall annual operating budget is about it's about a half million dollars, uh, which is which is a, a good deal larger than it was six years ago. So we've certainly seen some growth. And they have two but, months of production. Well, I mean, that's two months of production plus all of the, now the year-round arts education programming that we're doing is included oh, in there, right. and certainly overhead, of course, our administrative salaries and things like that. But but you get paid. Believe it or not, a little bit. A little you get bit. paid? I do get in paid. In the arts? Yes, yes. It's like unheard you of. You can. You can make a living in the arts. It's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> thing. But uh, the vast, uh, a significant majority of that, about 65% of that is, is contributed. Uh, and we're lucky that we have a lot of really wonderful corporate partners. You yeah, know, well, I see that you, uh, you know, the, those corporate logos keep yeah. expanding every time, every <laughs> we, year. You we know? try to make them expand. You know, we try to tastefully make them expand. But nonetheless, we do. We, we're, you know, we like to get creative about ways that we can bring on new corporate partners. You know, Albany Medical Center has been doing a lot of work, obviously, in the Park South community, and they saw us as an asset, certainly, to their development of that neighborhood. The BBL and Construction. Of course, we see them as a neighbor, an asset. So Albany Med's been our single biggest right. sponsor for the last five years. BBL Construction on that project, another major partner, and then the Nigro companies. But then also, you know, getting creative and finding ways to, to partner with other organizations. You know, GE has, has the wonderful Kids in Free program in the Capital Region. And we've been lucky to be a beneficiary of that. So, you know, our production of Oliver, Kids Could Come for Free. Our production of uh, uh, Shrek, the musical, Kids Could Come for Free. And of course, all of the seating is free, but we do have our reserve reserved seats down front, this allowed kids to sit down in that section and get the best seat in the house and, and you know, be able to watch And the how show. much are the seats for the, because the well, elderly like to sit down th there. They do, and, and we do our best to make those seats. If someone is in a, uh, incapable of walking the couple of steps to uh, even just to get to the first level of the amphitheater, we don't want them to have to pay for a seat. So we have a pretty generous policy when it comes to complimentary seating for those who need accessible and seating. And the ushers know that. They do. Oh, yeah, they do. And our box office knows it, too. You know, it's important to us. It's, it's the heart of the mission. So, but it's interesting, you know, there's a real, you really have to be careful with the, the pricing on those reserved seats. It's, you know, we don't make a lot of money on them, but it's right. a significant portion of our revenue. You want people to buy them. So uh, how much? We, we cap them at $16 and $18 okay. on the side section or in the center section. The last couple of years, we've done some special table seats down towards the front of the stage mm -hmm. where there's bar service and things like that. Those we can charge, you know, $20, $22 for. But and you if, get them? You we get do. People, yeah, yeah, we do. Those we sell out because it's an interesting experience, you yeah. know, to sit at a table just in front of the stage and have an actor come out and serve you a drink. That's kind of cool, you know. But if you charge too much more than that, when there's a couple of thousand free seats sitting behind you, people are just going to grab, grab sure. a blanket and head up. So, That's right. Uh, but a lot of folks do like to sit down on who the ground level. Who decides? Is that your decision of what's, you know, it's one play per the summer, isn't it? Well, no, actually, two. in the last it's couple of good. years, it's been two, and now it's even really turning into three. So uh, as, a, as the artistic director, it's ultimately my choice, but I, I make that choice in, in, in close uh, 
uh, discussion with our board of directors and they, they sort of ratify what I propose as a season. And of course that's important because for me, those folks who are serving on our board are representative of our, of our audience population. So if they see a season and they think, yeah, you know, that's not really something we think is we'd be interested in, that suggests to me that it's going to be a tough sell. And we've taken some risks in the last couple of years and we've gone a bit off the beaten path from what we've done in the past. You know, a couple of years ago, we did a show called Hands on a Hard Body which was a, a, a brand new musical, had only done a very, very short run on Broadway. Uh, but it's a really experimental And it's about and holding show. onto a car. Exactly right. Okay. You know, uh, keeping I just want you to know a, it's a Keeping your hand on a truck. <laughs> right, yes, it sounds like it's, uh, it sounds worse than it is. But, uh, no, it's very you know, innocent. Folks keeping their hands on a pickup truck and the last one to take their hand off wins. Right. You would never think that that would make for much of a musical, but it really is a beautiful story. And it was uh, Trey Anastasio, the, the front man of the band Fish, right. who orchestrated just a beautiful score to accompany it. But at the same time, we're still committed to doing really classic musical theater. You know, this past summer we did Singing in the Rain and The Pajama Game. And Singing in the Rain's appropriate because it rained a few times. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we were very lucky. Actually, the year before, Hands on a Hard Body uh, was the show that, that yeah. previous year, and it rained out uh, truly half of the performances really were canceled. Many. Half. That so that was part of what I got tired of people coming up to me and joking. You know, you, you should do Singing, <laughs> singing in the Rain. rain. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, we should do Singing in the Rain. And, and of course, that one hardly ever rained down. <laughs> so, except, you know, of course it rained twice a night when we wanted it That's to. Right. That was an interesting nut to crack, you know, figuring out how to get it to rain and look realistic on stage. It was, right. it was really neat. But, and what uh, was the second one you had? Uh, the second one last year was the pajama game. And we've sort of fallen into a, a pattern where in July we do a show that really highlights professional actors from this community and beyond. Folks that we find in New York City, folks that, that come from all over the country who are looking for summer work. Mm -hmm. And we've been fortunate to have some really, really wonderful people and to watch some really wonderful people right. from our community grow. Because as uh, you get those wonderful people up from New York City, they inspire the younger folks who you have on the stage who, who are acting maybe so that's for the right. second or third people? time. You do so. attract Broadway uh, uh, you, We've actors. had people that have been on Broadway, off Broadway, in films. And one of the really gratifying things is, you know, our August show continues to to be featured to feature local teens uh, and you know again I was in that program years ago I'm happy to still have a career in the arts and to be working locally but some of my peers people that I grew up with who have gone on to just absolutely amazing careers in the theater I mean right now there, there are I think immediately right now there are three people performing on Broadway who are former Park Playhouse students really? and yeah. over the course of the last decade that number is probably more like you know 10 or 15 people well, who you should publicize your alumni list well you know we have a who yeah. are who, where are they now section on our website but we probably don't put it out there as much as we right, should because yeah. it's a real badge of honor for this community to know it that is. there are kids growing up in the arts here that are going on to su 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 such success and we've mm -hmm. had kids not just in the theater world, but also in film and television, who have had a really good run of it, and it's it's you know, it's great for this region to know. T tell us a little about your story, how you got into the arts. Well, you know, I grew up uh, really having no connection to the arts whatsoever. My parents, of course, would take us to you know theatrical events, symphony events, things like that, but I never really participated in it. Uh, until I, I, I was always a soccer player and I had a, a, a series of broken knees that led me to yeah. sort of need to find some other activity to busy myself with and, and I found, I had always been sort of an expressive young man I guess and I found my way into a, a production uh, probably just, just before high school and I loved it. I loved it. I just found that I was at home, uh, and I met a whole bunch of new friends that I, you know, had never, never had before. And uh, immediately, pretty mm -hmm. much in high school, knew that I wanted to study that going forward. And my parents, got, you know, lucky for me, were very supportive of that. And I ended up attending the uh, university at New Paltz, which had a wonderful theater program for both the technical side of things mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, acting side. And they really encouraged you to take classes and to gain experience on both sides of the coin, backstage and on stage. And that was wonderful for me because I had really felt that I, uh, 
I, I liked the idea of the art of directing. And so I was able to try that out in college. And I worked briefly as an actor after college. I was in a, uh, the national tour of Fiddler on the Roof. Very and, good. And it's my favorite. See, there, 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 there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I also got to participate in some you know, regional productions and some, some productions uh, in New York City uh, and eventually worked with some of my uh, uh, closest friends just on a volunteer project down in New York City, sort of mounting shows in off-off-Broadway venues, Holes in the Wall, and some nicer off-Broadway venues, and was working in New York City at a company called Theater for a New Audience um, in arts administration. I had sort of found that uh, to, to be able to afford a life as an actor and a director, you really needed to have something else that you were passionate about that could pay the bills. And rather than being a waiter or a, a some other such profession, I, I found myself drawn to arts administration. And I had always stayed in touch with Park Playhouse. You know, I had directed a couple of shows here over the years um, in, during my college years. Uh, and after a, a number of years under the same leader, the board had decided to make a change and, and, and they had made that decision sort of in conjunction with the gentleman who was ready to move on. And at the time, things were sort of rough. I mean, the financial picture was, was uh, not, not as good as it had once been back in the late 90s and, and they invited me to come up and talk about what I thought might be possible here. Uh, and my sense was that we should sort of expand the summer programming, involve the young people more than had been you know, previously done Done, and then to sort of try to look outside of the summer months and, and find a, a more permanent presence because I think it's hard to succeed just as a seasonal being. I think that there needs to be, uh, you need to be in pe the people's presence of mind more often. And that's not. how you combine the palace that's with, right. with Park Playhouse. That's right. So when the city grant program ended, you know, to his credit, Mayor Jennings helped to bring together members of our board and members of the palace board. The palace had recently also gone through a, a transition in management. Uh, and brought the members of both boards together to talk about what might be possible in terms of a, a, some sort of collaboration. Certainly the palace has a, a larger budget and is a more stable organization, but one that you know, didn't have as much of a connection to the community perhaps as Park Playhouse did. Uh, it, perhaps people had seen it really just as a rental house and weren't aware of the work that the team at the palace was doing. So we entered into a management services agreement where my, my salary would be shared between the two organizations and some of our part-time staff would work back and forth. And our idea was that over time, we would be able to develop new programming sort of spearheaded by Park Playhouse, but housed at the palace. And it took about a year and a half, two years, but we finally have seen that uh, over the last over the last year or so really come to fruition. We've had three different uh, family style shows that were produced locally and played at the mm -hmm. palace for you know several thousand folks. <laughs> That, that we also now again take out into the schools mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, put on tour. Um, and now we share a number of different staff members, uh, you know, an arts and education coordinator who helps to coordinate education programs for both organizations. We share a production manager. We share concession management and box office management. So cuts down costs. Exactly. For both organizations, it cuts costs. But I think it, the, the other thing is that it's really allowed us to also think creatively about what, what can we do to you know, try to better the entire arts community. And it's worth noting, you know, we've shared uh, the Palace and the Albany Symphony Orchestra have shared a uh, financial management team right. for a number of years now. And it's been wildly successful for the two organizations. Again, cutting costs and improving the, the quality of services. So now you've got the Palace and Albany Symphony, the Palace and Park Playhouse. Right. Now maybe the Albany Symphony and Park Playhouse. Well, <laughs> you know, you never know. I, I, David Allen Miller is a friend and, and, and certainly someone that I'm in touch with quite frequently. And He's been on the show here, yeah. I, I'm, I'm he's sure great. he's, he's yeah. a great guy. He's been around. Uh, and next year is his 25th year as the yeah. conductor of the symphony. Another Beth really Emmeth member. Mm -hmm. That's Correct. right. With Shirley. And, and he, uh, uh, you know, so there's he a and collaboration. I have around ideas. Could we do a, a concert or something like that? Who knows? You know. Yeah. But I think that you know to to have all of these arts groups talking to one another, especially after that last economic downturn that really had been tough on right. a number of organizations. You know, sure. you look, you see Proctor's and Cap Rep working together, and the Palace working with these two organizations. I think it was it was out of necessity necessity that some of this happened. But the, the upshot is that there's a lot of creative thinking going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you look at an event like Wine and Dine for the Arts, which is every January now, that, that funds all of these different Albany arts organizations and has had just a tremendous impact. Um, it's, it's a good thing to have these organizations in the room talking to each other and, and working together to better the entire cultural community. So let me ask you about, in February, you're going to have a, a play called Freedom Train. Yeah. And it's about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. Correct. 
Now, the Underground Railroad was neither underground nor a railroad. <laughs> that, is, that is correct. Yeah, that is correct. But it's a harrowing story, you know. And, and uh, you know, from our perspective, you know, if you can take a musical like that and put it in front of kids, that promotes a different kind of learning. And, it, and they absorb the story in a way that well, I listen, think... Well, that's Black History Month, it February. Is. So it this is, ties in with Black History That's Month. exactly right. And, you know, at the Palace, we always try to have a couple of offerings during the month of February. You know, we've had for years our, our uh, Black History Month step show. Uh, uh, and, you know, this is just another addition to that. Yeah. yeah so yeah. It's, it's great. And then that will be followed up the, uh, by the third of our arts education series, which is a show in, uh, in the month of May oh. called Freckle Face Straw. Strawberry, which is a, a, based on a book by the actress Jodie Foster about a young girl who's uncomfortable with her freckles, mm -hmm. uncomfortable with her appearance, and of course, <laughs> and it's about her, uh, uh, you know, getting to be confident in herself, right. and comfortable with herself. So we try as best we can to freckles tie. Freckles goes along with red hair. Red hair yeah. goes along with freckles. That's who right. Knows? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this. Look at this. These are not age spots. These are freckles. Well, you got to come see the show. Okay. <laughs> but we try as best we can, in some way, to tie the, the the shows that we do in that in the Scholastic series to New York State curriculum standards and to things that that you know we think are our positive experiences. Well, I always kids. felt it, and I, again, Mark and I have uh, almost three hundred shows, and we have many arts, like you were saying, on and schools. And I always felt that. Um, you know, the hands-on is you're going to say, like, when you teach history, all right, you can read a book and learn mm -hmm. about history. Why don't you go up to the Saratoga battlefields and teach the Revolutionary War there? I mean, obviously, you can't go all over the United States and the world, but certain things are local. Or, I mean, it's the impression that a child has when they see a play instead of read a book or even read the play mm. is going to be so much deeper. I, I know that for absolutely right. Jewish also, hands-on, you know, not just reading a book, reading a book, reading a book, which, you know, Jewish religion is always strong on the books, but just hands-on and, you know, make your own things. You're making the chauffeur for Rosh Hashanah, mm -hmm. feeling it like you're saying, yeah, feeling it, doing it. It just gives a better, deeper impression on the child. There's nothing like a tactile experience. I mean, right. there's nothing like being able to sense. And, and you know, uh, I think what's amazing is we're living in a world now where technology has made it possible, for, in a certain sense, for us to be all over the world, uh, to be able to at least see on a screen moving images that 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 uh, you know of things happening in real time, and, and and there's a real benefit to that. But for me, as a theater artist and as someone who really cares about the experience of live performing arts, that is a blessing and a curse, mm -hmm. because of course I know that when someone is sitting in front of an actor who's Passionately speaking, it's no different than sitting in a congregation or in a church uh -huh. or wherever the case may be and, and listening to a rabbi or a pastor speak passionately. There is a difference in that human connection. And it's the same thing for, for actors, if, for an audience member watching an actor live perform. Uh, and so it's important to us to bring kids in because they get that tactile experience. And hopefully then they, they, they buy in mm -hmm. and they sustain the American theater going forward. Except so, from watching the Jewish view, or at least uh, here they have a presentation. <laughs> that's right. But all right. So, no, I know what you're saying. It's 100. percent There's like, I mean, just seeing the most simple, like a baseball game. Right. You know, you can watch on TV every show. There's 20, you know, games on TV every night. But mm -hmm. so why do people spend big bucks to go out there? There's nothing like that. That's right. To be really part of it. So I want to ask you, when are we gonna? When are you gonna do naming rights for the, uh, you know, the the stage area and the seating and you know. The stage, Key Bank stage, like we had Times Union Center, we had, yeah. you know, you can do, I mean, and that'll carry you through 10 years. I mean, well, it's it certainly will. I mean, you know, uh, there are opportunities like that, you know, Park Playhouse, because of the investment that Albany Medical Center has made in us for the last four years, we've called it the Albany Medical Center stage, and we promoted it as that, we announced it as that, and, uh, you know, and... and How we, much do they give you that you... Albany Medical Center was a thirty-five thousand dollars sponsor last that's year. That's all it takes to yeah. have the stage. <laughs> you know, that's a pretty good chunk of change by Park Playhouse standards. It really is. It's a very meaningful amount of money to us, and 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 we've been lucky to have it. It's not even uh, well it's, for the palace, though. Yeah. Uh, you know, you look at the kind of money that the, the, the Times Union Center drives in terms of their naming rights. Who who knows what that price tag would be? But you know, stay tuned. There's been discussion about that. Well, and it, good. It, interestingly they enough, should give you more money. Than well, that. when the when the uh, marquee for the palace was redesigned back in 2002 and 2003, there was a couple of little light sprigs above the name palace, above the word palace, and. 
uh, one of the architects who we, we spoke to recently just sort of anecdotally about you know how, how things were going in the building and talking about some of the leveling. And, and uh, they mentioned that that had been installed, those little pieces mm -hmm. of light had been installed with the intention of potentially someday popping them out and popping a corporate logo on there. So it's there's certainly, you know, you have to get creative uh -huh. because while organizations want to support the arts because it's the right thing to do, it's a good thing, it's good for the community, they want return on their investment and you can't blame them. They want they want to have a marketing presence to your audience and to people that are passing by and you know for the sake of the palace uh, uh, the Department of Transportation estimates that uh, uh, about 12 or so thousand cars pass by that spot every day. Uh, that's a really? significant, you know, you wouldn't think it, but then you stop and you yeah. think, well, it's the busiest exit off of 787. So, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a, a, certainly an incentive to any company that wants to position themselves publicly as a supporter of the arts. That's a beautiful marquee. It is. It so certainly it's is. It's the best marquee in the area. I, I would mean, think it so. Really is. I would think so. I mean, it's the way it's it wraps around. Nicer you. than Proctor's. I got to well, well, I look, no, in my I, view, in my view, you yeah, don't have to say yeah. anything. Actually, but, you know, Proctor's you know. recently did, uh, I know. it's a smaller mm. footprint there yeah. uh, in terms of that the front of the building. We're lucky to be right on the corner. You're right on the corner. Um, it wraps around and it just looks so classy. Yeah. And it's just phenomenal. And I really was impressed with what they did. Because yeah. if you look right behind the sign, you see the older building and all that. But they really did a nice job with the uh, fa facade. They know? did. And what's it's remarkable that they packed, and this was you know, at this point, tw uh, 13 years ago. Uh, it's remarkable that they packed all of this modern technology into something 13 years ago and something that looks so much like it looked in the 1930s. They, they right. redesigned it to look exactly like that. Ford Ford and just yeah. last year, we actually uh, uh, replaced every bulb in the building with high efficiency LED lighting right. through support from National Grid uh, and Rise. Uh, we were able to go so, green. But 4,000 bulbs in that market. But let me ask you about the, um, about the Park Playhouse, because who owns that property? The Washington Park is owned by the city of Albany, right. so but we're a special event. So you pay the city, or no. they give it to you for free? No, the city let the, the city supports you know because we're offering our product to free uh, free. But isn't that an in-kind contribution? Oh, certainly. So oh, what's the no value about of that, that. in-kind contribution? Well, you know, only just recently has the city really gotten serious about renting that space out. I think it's a pretty. It would be if you look at it. You know, we're there for three months. It takes almost a month to put it together, no, and no, then yeah. I think it would be a significant one, no doubt well, about it. So it's an. In I don't have a price tag on right. it, but it's a significant. Now, you could have the seating, you know, free, the free seating brought to you by or sure. made possible by a grant from such and such. You yeah, know? we could. And, you know, it's it's important. Sealy uh, mattress or something. That, you know, so. and, and, and the stage <laughs> and the, the reserve seating. I mean, you could name all of these different things. You but, could. So why don't you? Well, you know, I mean, the... the who knows? Maybe the future holds I'm that I'm here for to us, help you. you know? <laughs> That's good. I didn't know I was going to get the advice okay, today. I'm glad for that. But you know, you, you never know. Truly, I think it's a matter of, you know, sort of... Again, that that's a locale where a lot of people walk through. We we try to you know create signage opportunities for sponsors mm -hmm. to make sure that they're visible. But that's the, that there's certainly something that could be done around that. And I like the idea. You know, we um, we've had in the past sponsors be featured on the T-shirt. We go through an awful lot of T-shirts. People donating that get a T-shirt. Uh, the playbill. You know, someone wants to sponsor Absolutely. the back page. So yeah. it's a matter of finding the things that that you know people are going to put eyeballs on that you can give some in, you know return on investment back to your sponsors. But you know the relationship with the city with Park Playhouse, it's, uh, you know, while, while the city arts granting program may not be around anymore, you know, we're very, very fortunate to have a city that wants a space in the park to be used for the arts. So what's your fiscal year? Uh, our fiscal year runs through December, so it's January to December. December. It makes it easier okay. to account for the bulk of our activity happening right now. Okay, so are you, so now we're coming up to the end of your fiscal mm -hmm. year. Have you, Matt, have you made the money that you needed for yeah. this year? There's oh, yeah, this no will deficit. Be, this will be a little bit better than break even year, and that's what you hope for. You that's know, right. you hopefully yeah. you hope for a lot better than break even, but well, no, in because our business, you're not for profit. That's right. The margins and not are for tight. profit. You can make. 5% more than break even. Right. I believe that's what it is. Well, and, you know. and the important thing, of so course, then. is that anything that you do make over and above break even has to, you know, be put back, put back in. into the business. Can't go for uh, salaries. That's right. Now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. there's no bonus uh, available to you when that's you have right. a surplus year. 
but we're an organization that has significant capital needs. Yes. Uh, you know, we've we've True. always rented all of the lighting and sound equipment, and only in the last couple of years have we been able to invest in owning some of that, which really makes the process of putting everything up and planning out the season a, a lot easier. Not only does it reduce costs, but knowing that we have control over when that equipment arrives and the shape sure. that it arrives in, that's important. So, so who you know, do you rent it from now? Uh, right now we work with, uh, you know, a company called Creative Stage Lighting, uh, okay. and then we work with a company just out of Clifton Park called Specialized Audio Visual. Uh -huh. But we've had vendors of all stripes. I mean, the, uh, there's a wonderful organization locally called Technical Video yes, Incorporated. TVI. Yeah. TVI. And TVI, uh, just this past summer, was an in-kind sponsor. They filmed uh, The Singing in the Rain, had a series of short movies in it. Uh, they filmed those in their green screen studio free of charge for us, which was a real blessing. And then they actually donated the projector and the screen to show those movies. So, uh, you know, it's, again, getting creative to find ways to reduce your costs and to make the season affordable. So it's Phenomenal. wonderful to work with Keep them. up the good work. It really, Thank you. I'm so impressed with what, you know, you've done in the six years or five years that you're there. And, you know, it's just been great. So keep up the good work. Thank you very it's much. Phenomenal. Excellent. You're doing good work. Keep it rolling and keep it doing <laughs> we'll better and do with good health. That's Thank right. you.